Apple releases the fastest MacBook ever, and more coming up on today's episode of the latest in tech news. Hey Gadgeteer, you're just in time for the latest episode of the world's only 3-in-1 show on tech, gadgets, and gaming news. That's right, this is the latest in tech news. My name is Taylor Merrick, and if you're new here, hit that subscribe button right now so that you don't miss out on the latest episode, but hold off on that like button until you get to a section of the show that you actually like. Um, it's just a rule of thumb that, get it? I do when I'm watching YouTube videos. I've, it's been habit for years if I like a video that I'm watching on YouTube, I'll like it. I can't do it on TV as much as I, like, stick my thumb up to the TV screen or try to mush the button on the remote. It usually cancels out of the Apple TV, and then I got to reload it back in. Can't do it on Hulu. Can't do it on Netflix anymore. Can't re rate and review anything. But so long as you can on YouTube, that's what I usually do is I thumb the video up. And if it's, eh, then I just usually don't do anything. But glad you're here. Glad you're tuned in. Ready for the latest news happening today? Speaking of news, our feature story is, while well, Apple releasing the fastest Mac laptop ever, we'll be taking a little bit look at that. We'll also be taking a look at Google now letting you order food without a delivery app. Also, landscape videos are finally a thing on IGTV. We'll also be taking a look at funding your favorite open source project using GitHub's new sponsorship program. Also, Microsoft's new language learning app uses your phone's camera and computer vision to teach vocabulary, which definitely proves interesting. And in gaming news, we'll be looking at Daigo's new controller causing a stir in the fighting game community, and the very best Xbox controller might have just gotten an upgrade. All that and more, but before we can get to that, well, did you know that HP, Google, Microsoft, and Apple have just one thing in common? Other than the fact that they're IT companies, uh, they were all started in garages. Speaking of houses, if we just move out of the garage, did you know that Bill Gates' house was designed on a Mac computer? Yeah, it's a running joke, so in case you wanted to tell somebody about it, well, now you know. And with that out of the way, let's see what we have today in tech history. Today in Tech History brings you, well, the latest news on this day from the past. To see, well, where we came from and where we're going, hopefully, and not making the same mistakes, hopefully. Well, being that today is May 23rd, 2019, on this day in 1903, Paris, France, and Rome, Italy are connected by telephone for the first time. Feel free to congratulate um, them for finally being able to get along with each other. I know. Right? Uh, they got connected. It was old, old telephone. But also, on this day in history in 1994, Java development begins in earnest. Sun Microsystems Inc. formally announced its new programs, Java and Hot Java, at the Sun World 95 convention. Java was described as a programming language that, combined with the Hot Java World Wide Web browser, offered the best universal operating system to the online community. The concept behind the programs was to de design a programming language whose applications would be available to a user with any kind of operating system, eliminating the problems of translations between a Macintosh, IBM-compatible computers, and Unix machines. Now, obviously, you never heard of Hot Java because it <laughs> fell out of being hot, um, became lukewarm, cold, and then dropped like a hot pot of coffee. And Java went to continue on to, well, kind of become the backbone of... Um, Minecraft, as we know it, at least on PC today, and uh, it spawned a whole slew of bad programming languages like YAML. Don't let me get into that. Um, we should probably hop on over to today's feature story. All right, so Apple is releasing the fastest Mac laptop ever, and I know this has been out for a couple of days now, so it's not, quote, new or latest, but, well, we'll just have to make do. Apple's latest MacBook Pro has landed, and surprise to surprise, it is said to be the fastest Mac laptop ever. This time, the speed bump has been achieved with the implementation of an 8th core, 9th gen, Intel Core i9 processor. And boy, was that a mouthful to read. In practical terms, this means that you should get double the speed of a quad-core MacBook Pro and 40% more performance than a 6-core model. Music producers are among those who are said to benefit, says Apple, with the option to create bigger projects and use many more plugins. 
but as you might expect though, this level of performance does come at a price. Come on, it's Apple, so you're mostly paying for the brand name. The 8-core, 15-inch MacBook Pro starts at 28 hundred US dollars and if that's a bit steep for you what well, you could have a six core 15 inch model for 2400 US dollars dual core and quad core versions of the 13 inch MacBook Pro are also available will be coming out soon enough they had we're handing out uh, invites to WWDC um, earlier this week so exciting news surrounding that and uh, hopefully we have um, more problems fixed on the MacBook Pro coming I, I mean hopefully they figured out the problem with the keyboard but then again, I'm not much of a Mac user anyway, so I just sit there and look at it and go, Ooh, nice, googly, googly! Because uh, <laughs> I have... I'm sorry, I'm a little bit biased uh, about it. But if you guys like your MacBook Pros, let me know down in the comments. And if you're interested in, well, the new MacBook Pro that's coming, good, bad, or otherwise, hey, be sure to let us know. I'd love to have a conversation around this in terms of what you're expecting to come from it, how you hope to not be let down again, how you hope that if you're going to camp out, for when the MacBook release does come out to the stores, you're the first one to pick it up because you're a fanboy and Mac products work great and you've never had a problem with it. I'd love to hear from you too. Uh, I haven't had the greatest experience with MacBooks. Granted, I, well, the last Mac that I had my hands on for any length of time in terms of figuring out how it worked and playing video games was, oh goodness, like, uh, 15, no. Yeah, at least maybe a decade ago, um, and, and then some, maybe even 20 years ago. Yeah, that sounds more about right, about 20 years ago. Uh, back then, uh, it was a big old Apple Mac computer. So I know you're going to say, well, it's not technically a MacBook. Well, I only played, uh, what was it, like Sims the Roller Coaster and some simulator programs. So yeah, that's as far as I went with it, and I got really confused with it really quick. And uh, I don't know, a PC just happened to move more naturally for me for what I wanted to do on it, which was, I guess, repeatedly break things over and over again and fix it, um, to which Mac says, nothing breaks for us. Yeah, it all works great. So, okay, well, I better move on to the next stories before I, I, I suddenly get people mad and throwing peripherals at me. So let's move on to the next story. Google is now letting you order food without a delivery app. Oh, no. Oh, the horror. What are we going to do without apps to order our food from? Well, Google uh, decided to uh, change that up. Starting today, you can now order food directly from Google Search, Google Maps, or Google Assistant. The functionality works using partnerships with existing delivery companies like DoorDash, Postmates, and Chow Now, and means you can order from any of them without having to download an additional app or even visiting their website. In Google Search and Google Maps, the functionality works via a new Order Online button that will appear when you search for a supported restaurant. From here, you can pick between delivery and pickup and select which service you want to order food through. If the restaurant supports it, your ordering selections are all made entirely through Google's interface and Google Pay. Now, the Google Assistant implementation in iOS and Android phones works in a similar way. You start the process by asking Google to order food from a specific restaurant before selecting a delivery service and making your food selections through Google's interface. Alternatively, you can ask Google's voice assistant to repeat a previous order if you don't want to deal with the indecision of choosing what to order. There's no mention of whether this feature is available through Google Assistant smart speakers or, more usefully, Google smart displays. Now, the new functionality supports five different delivery services at launch, which is DoorDash, Postmates, Delivery.com, Slice, and Chow Now, and Google says it will add support for Zuppler and others in the future. Major delivery services like Uber Eats, Deliveroo, Grubhub, and Just Eats are currently missing from Google's roster. We'll see how that all sorts out. Now, this is just the latest in a string of restaurant-related features that Google has recently added to its apps and services. The most well-known of these is Google Duplex, a mostly automated voice assistant that's able to call up a restaurant on your behalf and make reservations. It's ambitious, but so far it's been met with limited success because it's like, wait, am I talking to a real person or a, a computer? Computer? Yes, Batman. Uh, who am I talking to? What do you want? I'm Bruce Wayne. I'm a Batman. So, at ye this year's Google I.O., the company also demoed a new piece of Google Lens functionality that allows you to point your camera at a restaurant's menu and see reviews from Google Maps. Interesting, interesting. So yeah, what are, you, what are your thoughts around all of that? It seems to be a big, huge update that happened behind the scenes along with a bunch of other things search-related-wise happening behind the scenes, but it broke the search engine for a, well, at least a day. 
but that's all back up and everything should be returning to normal now. So yeah, this is actually interesting. Granted, I've only just started ordering from apps and I think the only app I ever used was last year when my wife, well, we had our firstborn daughter at the hospital and I was like, I can't stand ordering hospital food. It's, uh, I don't even need to explain more hospital food. I wanted some real food. So I said, well, let's open up a, a delivery app. I believe I used uh, Uber Eats for that one. I popped it open, found a restaurant that I wanted, that I liked. It was nearby. And I was like, oh, cool. Right from here, it had the delivery time, everything on it. It went. It was so smooth, seamless, quick. I was like, Whoa. and they delivered it right to our door. Hot, fresh, ready to go. And it was just as good as being in the restaurant and eating it. And I said, thank goodness for Uber Eats. Otherwise, I would have been stuck eating hospital food. So... Yeah, that's as far as my experience goes, and I'm really liking it. So, do you guys kind of like this whole feature of just being able to order food mobile on the go and have it delivered to you? I don't know. Uh, I, I liked it, but I'm not going to use it all the time, specifically because I don't need to. Um, yet, I'm sure if you are in a situation where you do, uh, you will. Um, but I will say that the one caveat is you spend more money eating out than you do eating at home, making your own food that's healthier for you anyways. But if you don't really have any other choice, do look for deals. Do look for the savings the best you can. Do your best to eat healthy and eat a variety of different foods. So that being said, there is your uh, PSA for, well, at least this show, at least. Okay, moving on to some IGTV news. I know you guys love hearing about the new Instagram TV uh, application. Well, landscape videos are finally becoming a thing on IGTV. Yes, users can post horizontal videos on Instagram's video platform. It took them how long? Yeah, well, we think this vertical format works out a whole lot better. So maybe we're seeing like some weird reverse psychology thing where people are like, yeah, but then they see it and they feel sh like cut off. It's like, well, I would. If this is all you saw of my face, I, I would. I'd say, go like this. Oh, whoa, he does have ears. Oh, okay, guys, stop making fun of me. I'm making fun of myself because I'm dumb, but if you're making fun of me, well, now I'm offended. But Instagram's new, well, updates to IGTV will now feature videos in landscape view along with its traditional portrait format. The addition of horizontal videos isn't just a new feature for IGTV, it's a shift in the product's original purpose. You see, the company originally hoped that sticking to a vertical, hard-to-reuse format would force creators to come up with new content just for the app rather than just reposting youtube videos to which i alluded to yesterday it's still gonna post youtube videos and, and post youtube videos back over it ain't gonna work out and they're like well maybe if we introduce gadgets and i covered this in the past maybe if we introduce a tv like a really cool tv like a rectangle but you can take this rectangle and you can go like this and then it'll be like like looking at it like like this and then it's like but we still need to have the feature so that if you want to, you can turn it to look like this. But this way, you can watch your IGTV uh, videos this way and, and, and your portrait format this way. Uh, you can just connect your phone up to your TV and you can do that. And it'll be like, whoa, cool, dude. And be like, whoa, no way. And it'll be like, yeah. And it'll be like, uh, oh, I punched the microphone. And now it's sideways. So, yeah. Uh, we've heard from creators who want to upload landscape videos for IGTV. Similarly, we've heard from viewers who come across landscape videos in IGTV but want to watch them in a more natural way. Oh, gosh. I love how they just, like, they just admitted it right there. They wanted to watch them in a more natural way. I couldn't have been more obvious. Why do you... Okay, I need to read the rest of the story before I go off on a rant. If you guys want to rant, feel free to do so for me in the comments section. I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I wrote Instagram in a press release announcing the feature. For those of you unfamiliar with Instagram's standalone long-form video platform, while well, you're not alone, IGTV launched in 2016. It was promptly forgotten, only attracting a fraction of the success of Instagram stories. And we've already gone over the numbers a couple episodes ago. But Instagram is now trying its hardest to keep IG from TV from being lost in the shuffle back in February uh, IGTV clips started showing up on users' Instagram feeds. It's a development that, along with the litany of advertisements, stories, and suggested hashtags, will add more to Instagram's clutter, and that didn't work out great, and people were still not tuning in to watch the videos. 
a social site that once stood out for its simplicity. A straightforward feed of uniform square photos from friends is now something far busier and less personal. While embracing horizontal view might make IGTV more palatable for video creators, the move will likely just add to the deluge of content on an already crowded app. And I do remember, not too long ago, some executive having a disagreement with one Mark Zuckerberg, who then said, you know what? I quit, and he left the company. Well, this is what you get. I mean, I'm only just starting to... Okay, to be fair, I'm finally just starting to get used to Instagram more. I'm just starting to post a little bit more photos, a little bit more on videos. It's still confusing as I'll get out, because I... <sighs> I'm not one of you young spry folk who, you know, can just adapt to, you know, new products easily. I'm I turned 30 for crying out loud. I'm over the hill. I'm an old fart, you know. I'm just waiting for my hair to turn gray and fall out, which I please hope does not happen. But if it does, oh, well, I guess I'll just have to live with it. But I'll Photoshop it in to make sure I have a full head of hair. But we'll probably be moving on from apps uh, like IGTV and, 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 and Snapchat and something cooler of taking this place, obviously, as has been shown throughout the decades anyways but yeah i'm just starting to get used to it and now it's they're just gonna clutter themselves right into it and they're gonna walk right back into the same old problem so for good bad or otherwise well finally we're getting native natural landscape videos to igtv Okay, so for those of you who use GitHub, well, you can now fund your favorite open source projects using their new sponsorship program. And by the way, if you're interested in any of the articles that we have covered on today's show, head on over to technewsgadget.net forward slash 123. That's 123 uh, if you need the numbers. Uh, or, well, if you wanted to watch it video format and you're listening via the podcast, head on over to youtube.com forward slash technewsgadget. Now, Lifehacker is a big fan of open source software and an ethos of freedom, security, and transparency that often drives such projects, but software development and upkeep are not cheap, and even the most capable open source developers need help now and again. Luckily, GitHub just made it a lot easier to directly support projects and programmers you care about. Just, you know, Patreon, go do you. Goodbye. <laughs> GitHub introduced their own. GitHub, one of the largest repositories for hosting open source projects, now lets users donate to projects, teachers, coders, and other users who host their work on the platform. The system is akin to Patreon and other creator-supported platforms, letting sponsors set a monthly donation amount, while creators can benef create benefit levels to encourage sponsors to contribute more each month. You want to know what my thoughts are on this? GitHub, it's about time. Thank you for finally listening to your community. Because you did good. I mean, GitHub wouldn't exist without it. So uh, just don't don't jump off the deep end. You're doing fine, okay? I, I'm glad you finally decided to roll this out because the creators, there's no reason that they need to go to Patreon and say, well, support us on Patreon and it goes to GitHub. It's like, just introduce it on GitHub. I like this. So how to sponsor a developer on GitHub? Well, in order to sponsor one, you'll first need a GitHub account. Now, once you've signed up, you can sponsor another user by clicking the pink heart-shaped sponsor icon next to their profile name. Users who are sponsoring others will have a sponsoring icon as well. Note that not all developers will have access to this feature at first, but if you are interested, you should sign up for the sponsors beta waitlist at github.com forward slash sponsors. The sponsor feature is currently in beta and will remain so for the next year. During that time, GitHub will likely be making changes to the system in response to user feedback and usage metrics, but both sponsors and developers will have a few perks during those first 12 months. First, all the transaction fees will be waived for sponsors. These will be implemented once the beta period is over. On the other hand, to incentivize open source developers to use the sponsorship service, Microsoft has pledged to match up to $5,000 in contributions made in the first year. Now, while GitHub's sponsorship program will potentially help open source coders make a living or supplement their income after work, there's a valid counter argument to monetary incentives for developers. Open source software is normally developed to solve a problem or create a free alternative to otherwise premium and or centralized applications or services. The concern with these monetization models is that they could ostensibly put pressure on creators to focus on developing software that earns the most money and neglect more niche products. Well, right, there's a fine line to balance between that. Minecraft did really well for a certain amount of time, 
and then they just went. Notch's Island, there it goes, bye. So, um, that said, monetary support isn't a new concept in the open source world. Plenty of open source developers have tip jars on platforms like PayPal or Ko-Fi, and many free applications include and encourage contribution to donation links. So, here's your thoughts on that. And if you're interested, well, GitHub.com has more information for you. Okay, moving on to, well, I want to consider it like a, a mix between like a gadget and an app and tech news. Microsoft's new language learning app uses your phone's camera and computer vision to teach vocabulary. Now, this is kind of where it gets interesting. Eight Microsoft interns have developed a new language learning tool that uses the smartphone camera to help adults improve their English literacy by learning the words for the things around them. The app, called Read My World, lets you take a picture with your phone to learn from a library of more than 1,500 words. The photo can be of a real-world object or text found in a document, according to Microsoft. The app is meant to either supplement formal classroom training or offer a way to learn some words for those who didn't have the time or funds to participate in a language learning class. Instead of lessons, users are encouraged to snap photos of the things they encounter in their everyday lives. Originally, we were planning more of a lesson plan style approach, but through our research and discovery, we realized a Swiss army knife might be more useful, said Nicole Joyal, a software developer intern who worked on a project. We wound up building a tool that can help you throughout your day-to-day -day rather than something that teaches, she said. And there's a photo that goes along with it. Somebody took a photo of an artichoke and it said, artichoke. Read My World uses a combination of Microsoft Cognitive Services and Computer Vision APIs to identify the objects in photos. It will then show the word spelling and speak the phonetic pronunciation of the identified vocabulary words. The photos corresponding to the identified words can also be saved to a personal dictionary in the app for later reference. Finally, the app encourages users to practice their newly discovered words by way of three built-in vocabulary games. Now, the 1,500 word vocabulary may seem small, but it's actually close to the number of words foreign language learners are able to pick up through trad traditional study. According to a report from the BBC, for instance, many language learners struggle to learn more than 2,000 to 3,000 words even after years of study. In fact, one study in Taiwan found that after nine years of learning a foreign language, students failed to learn the most frequently used 1,000 words. Um, I would know that because I was in Taiwan for a year as an English teacher, which is a whole lot of fun. And then the flip side of that is me trying to learn Chinese. Oh my goodness, was that confusing. Just what's the most popular word so I can understand? The report also stressed that it was most important to pick up the words used day to day. And it's a lot of the way how I learned Chinese, at least in a more conversational tone. I didn't learn more of a formal tone. I just wanted to learn how to communicate in a conversation like, directions or locations of places or names of places or people or things now because the app focuses on things you see well okay so i'm gonna say that to just preface that's kind of how i picked up some conversational chinese so i understood uh, what people were saying and i could understand it a little bit more and, and and relate to them and survive taiwan not saying that was a bad thing but it, it helped me understand it a lot more so <laughs> i was definitely grateful for the learning now, because the app focuses on things you see, it's limited in terms of replacing formal instruction. After gathering feedback from teachers and students who tested an early version, the team rolled out a feature to detect words in documents, too. It's not a Google Lens-like experience where written words are translated into your own language. Rather, select words it can identify are highlighted so you can hear how they sound and see a picture so you know what it is, such as scissors, backpack, highlighter, notebooks, binders, notebook paper. So... Yeah, for example, the app pointed at a student's school supply list may pick out words like pencil, notebook, scissor, and binder. The app, a project from Microsoft's in-house incubator, Microsoft Garage, will initially be made available for testing and feedback for select organizations. Those who work with low literacy communities at an NGO or nonprofit can request an invitation to join by filling out a form. So they have a link to that if you're interested on the TechCrunch article for today's show. Okay, moving on to some gaming news. Well, Daigo's new controller causes a stir in the fighting game community. Now, I'm not, I'm not sure how many of you are interested in the fighting game community. You know, MK11, which helped break uh, download, digital downloads to the $8.8 .8 billion mark, uh, unheard of levels overall, including Fortnite added into the mix, along with, well, other fighting games that 
go on a Street Fighter, Tekken, you know. But Daigo Umahara is arguably the most popular fighting game player of all time. Uh, although there was one video that I watched of some guy who played, uh, I think it was on Tekken, he played Panda and managed to win it. Uh, like the world championship, which which was incredible. The like the most boring, crazy character with the most predictable move pattern beat the best complex champion character hero combination in the world. Anyways, as such, eyes will always be on him when it comes to high level of play. The legendary Japanese competitor caused a stir recently by announcing his plans to try out an unconventional hitbox controller instead of his traditional arcade stick at future events. Now. For those of you who don't know, Hitbox controllers are named for Hitbox, the company that first made them popular almost a decade ago. Instead of using a regular joystick, Hitbox peripherals handle directional inputs with the same moment buttons that perform attacks. This gives users a better handle on their movement thanks to the high-quality micro-switches found in normal arcade stick buttons as well as an easier, faster way to execute, execute, execute complex inputs like the Z-shaped Dragon Punch motion that is common in many fighting games, including probably, well, Injustice 2. So yeah, the Smash community has had a hard time coming to grips with these box controllers and debates still rage on as to whether they are fair or make the game too easy compared to a traditional controller. Most of the wider fighting game community has accepted these controllers as legitimate competitive tools, some more begrudgingly than others, for years. That doesn't mean it was an easy journey, however. When hitbox controllers first started to gain prominence, they were regarded at best as shortcuts to pulling off fighting game moves that normally took time and practice to hone. At worst, the use of these controllers was deemed outright cheating. Now, it didn't help matters when games like Marvel vs. Capcom 3 were discovered to handle simultaneous opposite cardinal input directions, otherwise known as SOCDs, in such a way that players who use hitbox controllers could block in both directions at one once essentially eliminating the dangers of mix-up and cross-ups and crossovers and all the fun that came with that but uh socd is a term that pops up a lot when you're researching hitboxes while these type of inputs aren't unique to button-based controllers the playstation 4's dualshock 4 controller for instance can perform the same technique by using the d-pad and thumbstick in conjunction they do diverge from what's possible on the fighting games community's most universally accepted peripheral the standard arcade stick now, to make matters more complicated, the way these are handled vary widely from game to game. Marvel, Marvel vs. Capcom 3 infamously allowed simultaneous forward and backward inputs, while Street Fighter 5 defaults to forward no matter which part of the controller is being used. So uh, we have an example here right on the screen. Uh, holding forward on the thumbstick and back on the D-pad and vice versa results in forward movement in Street Fighter 5. Now, um, I don't know. What do you guys thoughts on this have you been hang, hanging up with the hanging out with the news or hanging up or on the, on the phone and saying dad no you're not my friend anymore you keep on cheating at that game it that's it so i don't know interesting interesting thoughts is it time for hitbox controllers to stay do we need to have actual rules in the game to say no we need to use joystick or is joystick a, a, an old archaic notion that we should really move on from because well they don't have those all the time at, at, at arcade game places at least to the best of my ability but i don't know i could be wrong we could be entering a new age especially with the top player in japan or worldwide for that matter you know making his change public that he's going to be using hitbox controllers from now on i don't know if you're uh, up to well par with all the news that's been going on recently or, or you're interested or want to learn more hey drop a note in the comment section i'd love to uh well, or the rest of us, not just me, love to continue the conversation. And moving on to our last gadget gaming news of today. Well, the very best Xbox controller now has swappable paddles, thumbsticks, and even faceplates. That's right. Microsoft or Sony don't make the best controllers for your Xbox or PlayStation. Instead, did you know they're made by Scuf, a company that produces high-end customizable controllers instead intended for competitive gaming and people who want the best experience. So when the company announces a new super customizable Xbox One controller, well, you better get excited. Um, but this message isn't sponsored by them. I'm just reading an article uh, from Gizmodo. Now, the author here picked up their first scuff controller over two years ago and have been enamored ever since. But the big problem with scuff controllers is that traditionally, you have to know exactly how you want to customize it when you buy it. There's no modding after the fact. That was fine for PS4 controllers, 
Their scuff is basically the only manufacturer outside of Sony doing high-end controllers for the system. Meanwhile, Microsoft, Razer, and other others make solid Xbox One controllers that you can customize on the fly, ripping paddles off the back with abandon and switching out D-pads in a matter of seconds. That changed last year with the PS4 exclusive Vantage, which let you change out paddles, buttons, buttons, D-pads, triggers, and even the faceplate in less than 30 seconds. The biggest bummer of the Vantage was there was no Xbox One equivalent. If you wanted that kind of customization, you either had to plan and grab a built-to-order $140 Scuff Elite, or you had to go for Microsoft's more customizable, but not as good, $150 buck, buck Xbox Elite wireless controller. Now today, Scuff has announced the Scuff Prestige, a $160 US controller that appears to be every bit as customizable as Microsoft's Elite controller, but made by Scuff instead. The paddles, thumbsticks, and faceplate can all be adjusted on the fly, just as you can do with the Vantage. Unlike Microsoft's controller, the Scuff Prestige uses lithium-ion batteries and is rechargeable. Scuff claims it will last 30 hours on a charge. It also claims that at 262 grams, it's the lightest Xbox controller on the market. Well, keep in mind the Elite weighs 348. Now, while the Microsoft controller uses a traditional X wireless Xbox connection, the Scuff Prestige uses Bluetooth, which means you won't need a special dongle if you want to connect it to your computer wirelessly. But as for whether it's as good as it looks on paper, well, that remains to be seen. Scuff Prestige is available starting today from Scuff's website. So they haven't had a chance to review it yet, but I'm sure once they do, they'll have a link to that in the show notes. And, uh, well, you can go from there. It looks pretty interesting. So I don't really have an Xbox, so I can't tell you how customizable or cool or, or, or up-to-date or high-end this really is. Um, but so far as what I can tell based on conversations I've had with others and, and comments from other people and looking at it for myself, it seems like a good quality product. And if you have a scuff controller, hey, let me know down in the comment section. I'd love to know. I'm clicking buttons. <laughs> okay. Well, I think that about wraps it all up for today. With that being said, Thanks for tuning in to today's episode of the Latest in Tech News. New episodes every weekday. The Latest in Tech News can be found on every major platform, including Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, YouTube, Stitcher, Overcast, and more. Now, if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to let us do, uh, do a favor and let us know by clicking that like button and leaving a comment. Also, double check that you are subscribed and following so that you don't miss the latest episode. I'm your host, Taylor Merrick. And remember, for the Latest in Tech, Gadget, and Gaming News, visit Tech News Gadget. Net. Pretty much. Keep being awesome, guys. And I'll see you on the flip side.